Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today we're going to talk about Tivoli, the house behind me. I'm here on Woodbourne Avenue in the Govins neighborhood, if you know where that is. And Tivoli was built in 1855. At various times it was the summer home of Enoch Pratt, the library philanthropist, Charles Abel of the Aruna S. Abel uh, Baltimore Sun family. And today it is the Nexus Woodbourne Family Healing Center, um, helping uh, kids and their families. Um, I have to start with saying a thanks to a gentleman, Perry Bacon, for suggesting this. Um, I will sheepishly admit that I had no idea that this even existed before uh, uh, Perry suggested it, so thanks so much for the suggestion. Um, all right, where to begin? Over its 175-year history, there is so much going on here, I hardly know where to start, but I think we're going to start with widow's walks and cupolas and belvederes. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of architecture and hopefully work, hopefully work our way back over to, to children's health care. Um, all right, this was built in 1855 in the Italianate style, and it was one of many, many country estates that uh, had formed a ring around Baltimore at the time. I'm going to read uh, a few of those, and I bet you some of you will know, recognize some names out of these. Stonely, um, owned by Robert Brown, son of Dr. George Brown, who was the founder of the Baltimore Medical College and on the first uh, board of regents of the University of Maryland. Um, Evesham, there's now Lake Evesham, but Evesham was the summer home of Reverdy Johnson, a lawyer um, who represented John Samford, the slave owner in the Dred Scott decision. He also represented Mary Surratt, who was accused of being a co-conspirator in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He apparently uh, changed his mind. He supported the Union ardently during the Civil War and was, again, an ardent supporter of the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery. Um, St. Mary's, right near here, the summer estate of William Walters of the Walters Art Museum uh, fame. Among other things, Walters had hot houses built so that he could grow grapes year-round. Clifton. Uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, the philanthropist Johns Hopkins estate, and then Montebello, uh, the Garrett family estate, all uh, summer estates ringing here, um, all, most of which had Italianate summer homes um, like the one behind me, Tivoli, and most of them had uh, cupolas or widow's walks or belvederes um, of some variety. So let's say a word about those. Let's start with uh, belvedere. Let's start with cupola, actually. Let's start with cupola. A cupola is a dome structure, architecturally a dome structure, Structure on top of a building that was initially meant to bring light and sometimes air into the middle of a building. Um, Tivoli did not have a cupola. If you want a great example of a cupola, um, go to Hampton Mansion, the Ridgely family estate in Towson, now run by the Park Service. A wonderful cupola there. Our second term, um, Belvedere. If you're like me and someone says the word Belvedere, you think of the Belvedere Hotel in Mount Vernon, but that's not what we're talking about. Architecturally, a Belvedere is a structure on top of a building that was meant to uh, give access for people to go and take a look at some sort of commanding view, some, some sort of view or another. And then finally, Widow's Walks, which was a structure on top of a building um, that allowed people also to go up and look around. Now, the origin of Widow's Walks is a little bit murky. A lot of folks believe that it, they got their start in uh, New England, East Coast uh, coastal towns, um, as a place for uh, worried widows to pace back and forth, waiting to see if their husband's ship had come in. Um, there is actually not a lot of evidence for this. Uh, for one thing, um, widows' walks were a part of Italianate buildings all over the place, including houses that were nowhere near the water. Um, for a second thing, there is some evidence that the initial, what we call widows' walks, were platforms built on top of houses around chimney columns, not for worried wives to pace back and forth, but for worried homeowners whose chimneys had caught fire um, to have a platform to climb up on top of to pour sand down their chimney to try to keep their house from burning down. But Regardless of where it got its name, uh, widow's walks were part of uh, a lot of Italianate architecture, um, and Tivoli had one. Today, you can see the platform on top of the roof still. Historically, it had a nice railing around it. Um, that was taken down some years ago. Um, but uh, widow's, a widow's walk was part of this Italianate uh, building's uh, history for sure. All right, so we've talked about architecture. What was going on in this part of Baltimore County in the middle of the 1850s? Well, initially, this property was owned by a gentleman um, 
named William Govain, who had uh, got it, he got it from uh, Frederick uh, uh, Calvert, the sixth Lord of Baltimore. Um, the name Govain stuck. He called it Dumb Castle after his family estate in, uh, in Scotland, but that did not stick so much. Uh, Govain or Govins, the Govins neighborhood, did stick. Uh, by 1808, the Yorktown Turnpike had come in through here. Um, York Road as we know it today. And a little bit later, Govins Town Hotel hotel, um, which served mainly the farmers who were going back and forth, using the turnpike to go back and forth between York and Baltimore. Um, but it made an ideal place for a country home. It was still rural with fields and streams, um, cropland, but it had easy access to Baltimore City. The house was built in 1855. In 1870, Enoch Pratt and his wife bought it, along with 95 acres, and joined the other sort of merchant princes of Baltimore in their summer estates around here. We won't say too much about Enoch Pratt. We did a video on him and his uh, city house not too long ago, but I will mention that in 1896, this is where he died. He died at Tivoli. Um, three years later, 1899, a gentleman named Charles Abel and his wife Elizabeth purchased the property. Property. Charles was the grandson of Aruna S. Abel, who founded the Baltimore Sun. He rose up through the Sun's ranks to be a vice president and a manager. I think he went on uh, to join the Washington Post and then own one or maybe several uh, newspapers in Virginia. Uh, but he only got to enjoy his summer home here for about 10 years. In 1911, his wife Elizabeth obtained a divorce from him. She had been trying since at least 1907 on the grounds of what was called abandonment back then. I guess wherever Charles Charles was in the world and was uh, often not by her side. And, uh, after a couple attempts in 1911, she was able to get a, get a divorce. She got the house, she got the kids, um, and she got about $9,000 a year, which was a pretty hefty sum back then. Um, she lives here until 1926 when she dies tragically in her city house. She had been warming milk, a bottle of milk for her, uh, her grandson and fell asleep. And the uh, water boiled over, the milk boiled over and put out the gas fire, but the gas itself stayed on, and she was found the next morning, uh, died from asphyxiation. So an untimely death for her. But in her will, she gives the, uh, the property over to the Baltimore Orphans Asylum. Um, the Baltimore Orphans Asylum did not begin in 1926. It began way back, its roots back in 1798, in what was then called uh, the Female Charity School. The Female Charity School got its start to help uh, young girls, young women, um, who needed assistance. Uh, somewhere in the 1800s, it had moved to North Stricker Street and started accepting boys also, and it changed its name to the Baltimore Orphans uh, Asylum. Um, and then in 1926, it got this wonderful gift of a new home, plus 13 acres, uh, a building for a boys' dorm and a building for a girls' dorm, and it moved out here. In 1966, it changed its name to Woodbourne, and for several generations, many Baltimoreans knew this as just Woodbourne. Um, and then today it is the, uh, again, the Nexus Woodburn Family uh, Healing Center. And it uh, does inpatient residential treatment and foster care for children, and then mental, uh, mental health services for young adults. So I'm gonna wrap up by saying that in this nearly 175 year old Italianate summer villa with a widow's walk, it is wonderful uh, to see so much uh, good things going on for Baltimore's uh, young people. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.